Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Didi Lagesson, Executive Secretary for the Committee on the Present Danger China. We appreciate your interest in our weekly webinars in which we expose and analyze the Chinese Communist Party's unrestricted warfare against America and the help being provided to the CCP on waging that warfare by captured U.S. elites. We encourage you to visit presentdangerchina.org for information on new programs, access to videos of our past webinars, and tons of other very valuable content. Our moderator today is Frank Gaffney. Frank is the Executive Chairman of the Center for Security Policy and Vice Chair for the Committee on the Present Danger China. Frank, let's get started. Welcome everyone to this edition of our weekly webinar series sponsored by the Committee on the Present Danger China. It features a focus on two very important themes. One, what is the nature of the warfare that the Chinese Communist Party has been waging against us for decades? Uh, it's been called by them unrestricted warfare. And two, who has been helping them wage that war against us for, again, many, many years? This program promises to be one of the most surpassingly important of what is always a very insightful and I think urgently needed uh, education on the nature of the threat we face from the Chinese Communist Party, its designs, and what it will mean if it succeeds with its warfare against us, whether it's of the, well, free violent, so-called kinetic kind, or the actual violent sort that the Chinese now seem increasingly intent upon inflicting, certainly upon the people of Taiwan, and quite possibly many others, including our own assets and personnel, and even our territory. Today, we're going to examine the extent to which that sort of evolution from the unrestricted form of warfare to the shooting kind is now being prepared by the Chinese communists in the form of uh, an insurgency inside the United States to accompany and help achieve victory for them in a violent conflict with America. We have with us a very, very, I think, impressive array of talent today to address different aspects of that insurgency, how it might be mounted, at what points in the United States might it be targeted, what could be the effects if force used elsewhere is complemented by force used inside our homeland. And not least, what can we do to prevent all of that from befalling us, uh, deter it, and if necessary, try to mitigate the damage if it does in fact unfold. To begin with, I'm very pleased to have with us this time in person, a man who has contributed in the past, usually by pre-recorded videos. He is a veteran of the Special Operations Units of the United States military. He has also served as a very distinguished, courageous, and quite peripatetic uh, war correspondent in practically every nasty part of the world, uh, especially where there are, in fact, conflicts taking place. His name is Michael Yan. We have asked Michael to talk about his own firsthand observations of elements from China passing through the Darien Gap and what, using his professional skills uh, as both a combatant and as a chronicler of combat, he makes of the character of the Chinese nationals, not necessarily all of them, 
but a sufficient number of them to pause, give us pause, give us real concern about what the Chinese are about at the moment. With that, Michael Yon, thank you for joining us today. And um, I know you've had to go to some lengths to be able to be with us. We're very appreciative, as always, of your time and your expertise. And the floor is yours to address the question of uh, knock, knock, who's there in the Darien Gap from China? Uh, thanks, Frank. <clears throat> and yeah, I dove back into my hotel. We're on the border days and nights, often typically until sunrise, actually, recently. Right now, I'm actually uh, near San Diego. Uh, we've come across from Texas all the way through New Mexico, Arizona, hitting spots, found a lot of Chinese in um, Arizona, although many actually crossed in Texas uh, and more recently uh, and here as well. But I have not encountered Chinese here in uh, California yet, even though many are flying to Tijuana. But we can get into that. Many of the Chinese that you encounter actually uh, act like they don't speak English. And I think most actually probably do not speak English. But there's ways to suss out if they speak English or not. For instance, oh, watch out, there's a big snake by your foot, you know, and if they react, uh, you know, watch out, poison snake, that, those sorts of things. If they, you know, react quickly, then, you know, you've, you've caught them, right? Because typically they're, they're acting uh, like they don't speak English. Now, in Darien Gap, I have met, and for those who don't know what Darien Gap is, that's the, they call it the gap because there's you, through various highway systems, you can come all the way from Alaska to Tierra del Fuego in the bottom of South America uh, by road, by motorcycle, if you wanted to, except for this one gap of about 60 miles um, with no roads, right? Uh, although roads are slowly being built through it and the Chinese are part of that. Um, and this would connect Colombia and Panama. They call it the gap. Actually down there in Colombia and Panama, where I go frequently, they call it the, uh, the the tampon, they call it the plug, right? And so the, the, the Darien plug. And so this is the place where I've been warning about, I've been going there ever since actually Biden was uh, in place in the office, uh, because uh, Darien, this, the Darien Isthmus is the, is the huge highway to the United States for the world, right? Not just people from South America, like Venezuela, as we know, Venezuela has collapsed, but also the people from Africa, they'll go to Brazil often first, or Haitians will go to Suriname, and they'll just work their way to Colombia and go through the Darien Gap. Now, the Chinese, many of the Chinese are going through Quito, Ecuador, and through Quito, they'll jump on a bus. It takes about two days, and they'll go to a place called Nicocli in uh, uh, Colombia, and from Nicocli, they'll get on a boat and go to another place in Colombia called Capargana, which I've done. It's boat rides, as I recall, maybe an hour and a half, and from there, they enter the Darien Gap, and they go and they exit in Panama. <clears throat> so typically I intercept the Chinese in Panama because they come out of the jungle very tired. Um, now, a lot of people ask, why would the Chinese go to the effort of going through uh, Darien Gap when they can just show up in ships or that sort of thing, which they are showing up at airports every day or they've already been in the United States 20 years or, or more. And uh, Iris Chong, for instance, uh, her parents um, were mainlanders who met in Taiwan, you know, the author of Rape of Nanjing, which was just nothing but an information operation, actually, which I researched intensely and, uh, in fact, flew to China and, and all these sorts of things, researching that. I spent a lot of time in China myself. Uh, but the bottom line is they do come over. It's a full spectrum invasion, right? They come over as university professors or uh, anchor baby sorts of programs and that sort of There's many ways that they're getting in. But some of the people are at least 200 a day at this point, but that number is increasing or coming through the Darien Gap, right? And now some of these people coming through Darien Gap are quite suspicious. For instance, one, about two months ago, there's this one area of Darien where the Chinese come out. Um, and so I'll just sit there at nighttime and talk with them as they come out. People will talk more at nighttime. They talk more when they're tired, emotional, hungry. And we found this one guy about two months ago. His name is uh, Lushan Zhao, right? And uh, it, that's the name he gave. That name did check out. So I talked with him for about an hour and a half. He was itching. Lushan was. He had the uh, he had what they call the official accent. As you know, people who would watch this program might be familiar with the uh, GS of the PLA, the general staff of the PLA. They have a language school. Uh, it's a special language school. I went to a military language school when I was in special forces, but we just learned to speak the language. We just I just learned to speak German. Right. I didn't learn to become a spy, but they have a language school uh, in Luyang, which they teach you all the body language, when to say man, when to say yo, when to say this, that, and the other, and getting all the body language right. 
perfect spy stuff, right? And uh, and he had that official uh, accent. Now he checked out, and I'm going to tell you his story. So I intercepted him coming coming out of the Daring Gap late at night, maybe midnightish. He was tired, he was hungry, he was itching, and he talked right and for about an hour and a half, all recorded. He said that uh, you know he was you know no he knew exactly how to say yo and all these sorts of things right when to throw it in. Now some people who've heard the audio say he does not have an accent. He clearly has an accent. It's just very good. And um, it, actually, if you're learning a, a language very different from your own, like Mandarin to English or Mandarin to Italian or German or you know, German to Mandarin or English, you, you typically cannot learn it without an accent if you learn it after puberty, right? You need to learn that. Typically, you need to learn that language before puberty unless you're like a superstar language learner, right? And so there's a, a workaround around that, and that's where these special language schools come in to teach you how to cover up for your accent. Like, you know, so you're watching, you know, Bonanza programs, your teacher or, you know, professional wrestling, you're watching baseball, NASCAR, all these sorts of things. Your, your, your language teachers are from Canada and the United States and Australia. And you're, you, you really uh, learn the body language too. It's like, don't just learn the language, don't learn the words and the syntax, but learn, you know, speak the, speak the street jive sort of stuff. Right. And, uh, and, and know all the nuance. So he had that, right? The official accent. Now, he told more than he probably should have. He was itching. Again, he had these, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I got a, a message, but I can't actually read it. <laughs> but I, I'll, I'll finish up here soon if you, if you want me to finish. I can't read the message. I can tell that somebody had just sent the message. But the bottom line is, is he, um, uh, Lushan Zhao, he said that he had gone, he had flown to the Bahamas. He bought a boat from a, uh, from a Scotsman for $5,000. He was, um, he was uh, actually on his way to Florida and he ran out of fuel. And he said that he was picked up by the U.S. Coast Guard. Now, this confirmed the Coast Guard did pick him up on March 8th. He was adrift at sea. The U.S. government, he said, deported him over to, um, uh, to the Bahamas where the Bahamas were actually deporting, the U.S. Coast Guard sent him to the Bahamas. The, uh, the, the uh, Bahamas was deporting him back to China, and his, his, um, his uh, stopover flight was in Cuba. He changed his flight to Quito, Ecuador, and from there he took the boat ride and came to, uh, well, then I found him coming through the Darien Gap. <clears throat> A lot of the story is checked out. Uh, I'll, I'll skip some of the details, but the bottom line is, he clearly looks like a paramilitary coming through, right? And there are a lot of guys like this coming through. Uh, but the, usually they will not admit to speaking English on the level that he did. You have to use the watch out for that snake trick and that sort of thing. Anyway, I can go on for hours, Frank. So you'll have to tell me when to press pause. Well, this is a good point in which to press pause. If we can, Michael, we'll ask you uh, to stay with us for questions if you would. Um, the idea that we're looking at significant numbers of Chinese nationals who might qualify as paramilitaries or worse, perhaps, uh, is a topic that we've asked another of our border watchers, uh, one of the best, I think, analysts of U.S. Uh, immigration policy and what is actually flowing from well, what passes for such policy uh, in the Biden term, um, that would be Todd Benzman. He is the author of a brand new book on the subject of Joe Biden's catastrophic damage that he's doing uh, in the worst border crisis in American history. The title of the book is Overrun, and he has been on both sides of the border monitoring who's coming through and has had a chance to interview some of these Chinese young unaccompanied men uh, that uh, we've just heard from Michael Yon have been in the Darien Gap headed our way, and uh, it turns out they've actually been coming into the United States in some numbers. Uh, Todd, we're very appreciative of you taking the time. The last time we caught up with you, you were uh, on the other side of the border, and it was hard uh, for you to join us, but we're really appreciative of all the work you do, and the floor is yours, sir. Appreciate it. Well, I thought I'd just start out with a little bit of context. Uh, for one thing, we know that Chinese have been nationals have been crossing the southern border for many years. This is not a brand new phenomenon. Every year for the last, you know, 10, 15 years, we will typically have anywhere from, you know, a thousand to three thousand Chinese cross that border. 
I, I would say that the intelligence community regards that most of these are going to be probably economic migrants, but uh, there is obviously a recognized, uh, you know, espionage infiltration threat here as well, because, you know, why not? Um, so uh, we should keep in mind that the, the, the Chinese who are coming over now, I think, are in uh, far larger numbers than we've had in the last 10 or 15 years on an annual basis. One thing that I'd like to bring up about the uh, about this this threat issue, the espionage threat issue, uh, which you know would always precede kind of a kinetic war threat issue as well, because uh, you got to have your intel uh, on the front end first, uh, is that you know Chinese the Chinese government the PLA has always had an interest and great success at infiltrating spies into this country, not just over the border, but through the F-1 and J-1 visa programs. These are the student uh, and cultural exchange visas. Uh, when Trump was in office, uh, he uh, mounted a, a really aggressive uh, campaign to root out Chinese spies who had infiltrated places like Berkeley and MIT and all of our most cutting edge uh, academic research institutes where they were just thieving openly for years and years and years, taking our kind of dual purpose, dual use, cutting edge research uh, that could be used for military purposes and getting it to the CHICOM, to the Chinese government. Um, I wanna say that we had, by the time Biden entered office, the Trump administration, the DOJ had probably prosecuted uh, three or four dozen of these spies. And in the course of those prosecutions, you know, they scattered like cockroaches when the light went on in the basement kind of a thing. And they started fleeing left and right. And the result of that was uh, what's called, it was a federal regulation, a proposed regulation called, uh, to, 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 it was 2020 20845 very important regulation uh proposed in September 2020 that would have put pretty tough restrictions on the amount of time that these spies or you know scholars could be at a research institute without having to go in for a face-to-face -face interview with ICE officers who are trained to root out uh spies to do eye to eye and to pr provide biometrics. Whereas in the, in the past, the, all of this was, was given to the research institutes that were not very skeptical. Let's just say that they're not skeptical about who they were letting in to their, uh, their uh, academic institutions and their labs. Um, that proposed regulation, it was called establishing a fixed time period of admissions and extension to stay procedure for non-immigrant academic students and exchange visitors would have just absolutely cut the legs out from under the Chinese uh, uh, espionage establishment in this way. It was almost, they were a week or two away from approval in July 2021 when the Joe Biden administration killed the whole thing and returned everything to the way it was. So we have to assume that the J and F visa programs are absolutely wide open and that it's still going on. The administration even dropped charges against five of those spies with no explanation at all, just dropped the charges just ahead of a, of a state visit to Beijing, the first presidential state visit, kind of like a SOP. Um, anyway, that's kind of the backdrop in the, the, to, to the uh, border crossings because we have to understand that if the PLA is, is uh, using every other possible way, every uh, system that we have to infiltrate its military people, uh, then they absolutely, I'll bet a paycheck that we have spies coming in over the border right now. Um, I wanted to just point out before my time is up, is up that uh, Michael mentioned uh, the Darien Gap. That is definitely a way that they're crossing through. But, uh, but Ecuador, 
Uh, I'd like to identify and point my finger at Ecuador, which has an incredibly liberal visa free in, in for most countries in the world. You can just fly in. This has been an absolute boon to uh, human smuggling organizations worldwide. Uh, happy to bring all your uh, clients right in through Quito because you usually don't even need uh, any kind of visa whatsoever. Uh, the Chinese do need a visa, but they need the simplest online tourist visa. Uh, so what they're doing is the Ecuadorans have this major campaign, uh, advertising campaign targeting Chinese tourists to come visit the Galapagos Islands, which is uh, probably Ecuador's, you know, premier, one of the world's premier uh, tourist uh, destinations. And people ask, well, you know, why do the Chinese give them permission to uh, enter? And, you know, they don't know where they are, wh whether they're coming or going or whatever. But tourism is most definitely uh, encouraged. And when the Ecuadorans target the Chinese market like this, all they have to have is uh, they have to show a two-way round-trip ticket. So you only use one of them, obviously. And you show some bank account statements that may or may not be accurate. And then you just fly to a neighboring country and then fly into, you know, transit and then fly directly into, because they don't have any direct flights right now. Uh, Quito, uh, Ecuador has been ignored. When Trump was in office, they went down there and said, hey, you're going to sew this up right now on all these Muslims that you're letting just uh, pass in. You're going to put restrictions on these 12 or 13 nationalities. And I haven't ha heard word one about Ecuador since. Uh, and certainly nobody's raising any questions about all these Chinese tourists coming in to see the Galapagos Islands. Because uh, then they just head straight over by bus, like Michael said, and they just head on, head on in. Uh, I, again, a lot of these are going to be economic migrants, but a lot of them are going to have had military service and are going to be owing the government. They're going to have family back in China that they have to worry about if they get out of line or they don't toe the line, uh, that sort of thing. And with that, I'll just yield the, the podium. <laughs> Thank you very much for these remarks. Uh, we're going to turn next to Richard Fisher, who has been on these programs frequently. We're very appreciative always of his contributions as to uh, our television program as well, Securing America. Uh, he has been giving a lot of thought to the uh, growing military might of the Chinese Communist Party, um, its People's Liberation Army, and the various um, capabilities that it is amassing for both uh, conflict here on earth, uh, in the heavens, underwater, uh, and not least uh, what kinds of uh, uh, attacks it might be able to mount here inside the United States, especially if, uh, among other things, it is able to call upon Chinese nationals, uh, either those now being imported or those already here as students and otherwise. Um, Rick is uh, the author of an important book about uh, China's growing military reach, uh, the you know regional and uh, worldwide capabilities that are now being brought to bear. And uh, we wanted to catch up with him to talk a bit about uh, how Chinese military doctrine um, involving surprise, uh, deception, and insurgency uh, could be something now in the works and uh, the threat that that represents. Uh, Richard Fisher, it's so good to have you with us from the International Assessment and Strategy Center. Uh, the floor is yours, sir. Frank, thank you very much for uh, including me in your in your webinar. And I would just like to add my own uh, personal thanks to uh, uh, Michael's and, and Todd's uh, uh, excellent uh, briefing as to uh, what is happening. As Frank mentioned, I'll be exploring some of the why this is happening and uh, look a bit at uh, doctrine or what is more appropriately translated by the Chinese as, as strategy and also some uh, a bit of historical uh, antecedent to uh, make the case that uh, yes, China has been for decades 
putting its people in place in the United States in preparation for wars that could be upon us as early as December. I, I say December uh, because uh, according to sources that I have, the Chinese Communist Party is telling its members that China could be at war with Taiwan uh, as early as this December. Uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, the Chinese Communist Party would want to uh, have this message relayed. It would want to create fear in Taiwan, fear in Washington, and uh, promote uh, uh, concessions by Taiwanese and by Americans as, as it builds up and uh, basically has the capability to uh, mount a, a credible blockade and even invasion of the island democracy of Taiwan. But why would the Chinese Communist Party be just as interested in, if you will, invading the United States if its real target is to invade and conquer Taiwan. Uh, well, first, we should consider that China would want to hide such a strategy uh, for as long as possible. Uh, the Chinese have historically, as, as part of their ancient and, and well-developed strategic culture, have prized secrecy and deception. Sun Tzu, one of the most famous of, of China's ancient strategists, uh, wrote, quote, that uh, you should always try to, quote, mystify, mislead, and surprise the enemy, unquote. He also stated, quote, let your plans be dark and impenetrable as night. And when you move, fall like a thunderbolt. And of course, his famous line, quote, all warfare is based on deception, unquote. Now advance to uh, 1999. Uh, one of hundreds of Chinese books on strategy uh, emerges called Unrestricted Warfare by two PLA colonels, uh, Cao Liang and Wang Zhengshui. And this book uh, contains a remarkable exposition lauding the tactics of Osama bin Laden. This is uh, almost three years before he actually struck Manhattan. These authors laud his tactics and furthermore, laud how war is becoming civilianized, that entire populations uh, are, are, are being mobilized for the conduct of war. And this in 1999 is followed by policies that emerge in the late 2000s of what the PLA called civil military integration. And then by the early 2010s had switched this to military civil fusion, not just integration, but actual fusion. Uh, the whole idea is that the civilian economy and all civilians potentially can be put at the service of military goals and even military operations. And today in China, uh, a Communist Party official uh, conducting the equivalent of, let's say, a stump speech to inform an audience or to uh, uh, highlight an event or, or uh, a policy, a policy forum, usually will not fail to mention how the listeners must contribute to the policies of military civil fusion. And we see this mainly at play in terms of how 
all civilian technology is made available to the People's Liberation Army for exploitation, but also in the how the civilian transport sector, airlines, ferries, barges on rivers, are also all mobilized for military transport missions or potential transport missions and will be mobilized for the invasion of Taiwan. So when we consider all of the quote unquote civilians that have been flowing into the United States uh, since the normalization of relations and before, then we also must consider the civilianization of military strategy and even how they are mobilized under policies of military civil fusion. So we have 300 plus thousand Chinese students in the United States. We have tens of thousands of, of, of Chinese business officials that transit the United States every year. And now we have the influx on our Southern border. What military missions could they be assigned? How could they help the Chinese Communist Party win the war over Taiwan? Well, I mean, you can just let your imagination run wild here. Uh, uh, just taking an order of battle. Who in Washington, D.C. has anything to do with military policy, military orders, uh, military functions that would respond to a Chinese invasion of Taiwan? You take that order of battle, and if you have thousands, tens of thousands of, of your citizens deployed in the greater capital region, then you give them assignments. You, you, you uh, order that they have the means, the wherewithal, they go to civilian target practice range ranges, and they have the, the training, therefore, to, to use weapons that they can purchase in the United States legally against this civilian order of battle that is in charge of mobilizing and conducting uh, uh, the response to China's invasion. You have Chinese that live around military bases, Chinese that live around uh, especially the bases in California and Alaska that would be in Hawaii, for that matter, Guam, that would be first mobilized to send forces to the Taiwan theater of operations. Imagine what could be done to uh, uh, impede or even prevent the United States from mobilizing those forces to uh, conduct their missions in defense of, of Taiwan. Uh, and on and on. Uh, the Chinese, of course, are, are depending upon our not being prepared. And uh, I, would, I would conclude by by reading a passage from uh, Unrestricted Warfare, uh, even though the United States bears the brunt, quote, of being faced with the threat of this type of non military war, terrorism, and has been the injured party time after time, yet what is surprising is that such a large nation unexpectedly does not have a unified strategy of command structure to deal with this threat. What makes one even more so wonder whether to laugh or cry is that unexpectedly they have 49 departments and offices responsible for anti-terrorist activities but there is very little coordination and cooperation amongst them this is the chinese attitude towards our ability to prepare for a threat that they're organizing back in 1999 their their attitude one must consider that today their contempt is just as strong, if not stronger. And I'll stop there, Frank. Frank Fisher, a considerable food for thought in all of that and um, ominous thought indeed. Um, we will come to you with questions uh, in a few moments if you can stay with us as well. Uh, we're gonna turn next though to uh, J.R. Nyquist. Uh, he is a strategic analyst, a uh, member of our committee on the present danger of China and a man who has been studying closely the various totalitarian threats to our country, uh, notably those emanating from the Soviet Union uh, in the past, uh, Russia today, as well as, of course, the Chinese Communist Party. 
uh, one of the people that he has interacted with, uh, now deceased, alas, but in the past, uh, the top Soviet military defector to the United States, uh, Stan Lujev, um, is uh, a source for some further insights that we think are relevant to the present topic um, that shed, well, again, important light on the extent to which insurgencies uh, brought about by uh, armed elements insinuated into the United States is part of the, China, the uh, communist playbook going back to the Soviet era. Um, Jeff Nyquist, it's great to have you with us as always. Um, welcome and the floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Um, as a preliminary remark, I would say China is a communist country and communist military doctrine has a revolutionary insurgent aspect. And uh, as it appears in Soviet and Chinese military writings, it asserts the necessity of occupying the enemy's territory. This is very important. Um, now, I I got to know Colonel Stanislav Lunev. I did work with him. Uh, he spoke fluent Mandarin. He'd worked in China. It's important to understand. Uh, he defected in March of 1992. And among the things he had was important information about the developing military and intelligence coordination between Russia and China, uh, not just under the Soviet Union, but under the new Russian Federation that had taken shape after uh, at the at the very end of 1991. Uh, so uh, here's what Lunev had to say about Chinese strategic plans. He said in 1991, the Chinese and Russian intelligence services signed a treaty to share all intelligence on the United States and to coordinate all their intelligence operations. Um, uh, there was a 1992 post-Soviet plan of invasion in a projected future war with the United States where China would acquire the lower 48 states and Russia would get Alaska and parts of Canada. Um, uh, this invasion plan, Lunev often spoke of as involving the pre-war infiltration of the United States um, uh, by special troops and cadres and agents uh, and the construction of hidden weapons caches, uniforms and other supplies. He even testified before Congress about Russia's methodology for choosing sites for hiding nuclear weapons in the United States which would be deployed in the months preceding a war. Uh, he said chemical and biological weapons would also be smuggled into the United States and used. He also told me uh, something interesting. He said that they would attempt uh, to make these forces appear like they might be Arab terrorists or might be the actions of another country, not Russia, uh, maybe not even China. So you, you wanted to create the maximum confusion and he often said that uh, the operational model for this invasion of the United States was inspired by Hitler's 1940 invasion of Norway. And in that invasion, you know, uh, Norway is not connected directly to Germany by land. So Germany had to do an oversee a cross water invasion of Norway to take it. And so Lunev would discuss the various elements of this invasion that really fascinated Russian planners and would obviously be on the mind of Chinese planners. Uh, first, you had they had control of the defense minister of Norway. Uh, Vidkun Quisling was a Nazi sympathizer. And so the defense of Norway was in the hands of a German agent, in essence. Um, he was able, Quisling was able to disrupt or sabotage aspects of Norway's uh, defense as this infiltration invasion was was beginning. Um, Lunev said that the Chinese would aim to acquire such quislings in the U.S. administration and in various U.S. agencies to help facilitate their infiltration. Um, the leading edge of German troops in the invasion of Norway would enter as civilian tourists. And so we've had a discussion about Chinese entering. You have you know, China China and America, like Norway and Germany before 1940, were trading partners. There's a lot of ships going back and forth. There's, there's traffic. There's people going back and forth. And what the Germans did is that they had secretly planted uh, 
arms caches with uniforms and everything in Norway in the event of a future war so that German soldiers could enter as tourists from Sweden or wherever, and they could just go put on those uniforms at a given time, take those weapons, and they could seize airfields, they could assassinate key officials, they could hit power stations, and they could grab port facilities to help enable the invasion of the country the, uh, as an infiltration invasion. Um, this would facilitate you know, German plane loads of troops coming into airfields and feel safe to be able to land. Um, the main invasion force, the largest number of German troops, of course, were going to arrive by merchant ship along with their heavy equipment. And so since uh, German merchant ships were accustomed to just coming into Norwegian ports and offloading, these ships would be filled with German troops, and they were, and with heavy weapons, so that they could, all they needed to do was secure the ports with their, their advanced troops. Uh, the idea of the advanced commando troops was, uh, uh, Lunev called it the Brandenburg Regiment concept. The Brandenburg Re Regiment was controlled by German military intelligence, just like the Spetsnaz troops of Russia and China are controlled by their military intelligence. Um, the attack would be calculated to paralyze the government, to spread confusion, fear, and demoralization, and to assure the rapid collapse of the defense, which is what happened in Norway. It was, it was quite uh, well done in 1940. And, and the, the Russians envisioned this future invasion of America as Mexico playing a very vital role in this. Uh, that uh, Lunev would often say that the, um, the Zimmerman telegraph, which was a German diplomat who said, hey, maybe Mexico could be our ally, that, that it was ahead of its time. But it was the right idea that Mexico could be an infiltration route and an ally, uh, that this was something that had to be developed also clandestinely. Um, now, what's interesting is that we do have evidence, you know, and people can debate about it along the lines, testimony and evidence for Chinese preparations along these lines that Lunev spoke of. Uh, this evidence uncovered in Mexico has been presented by an American journalist named Scott Gilbranson in a book titled The Silent Invasion, which was published a little over 20 years ago. Uh, Gil Gilbranson, with his Mexican sources, found the following uh, items. Smuggling of arms and ammunition by China through the port of Ensenada, which they were managing at the time. Uh, testimony on the presence of Chinese, Russian, and Cuban special forces troops training at secret locations in Mexico's northern deserts. Uh, he had testimony from a Tijuana policeman who supplied these troops with food. Um, uh, and that Tijuana policeman was assassinated uh, later in his, uh, in his book. He describes how this man was killed. And then the smuggling of arms and ammunition across the U.S. border to create actual arms caches and uniform caches in the United States. And there he, he went to witnesses, actual officers of the U.S. Border Patrol and others, who gave him information about how smuggling worked and how the corruption of uh, border officials facilitated the movement of drugs, but also the movement of Chinese arms. And Lunev had always said that the movement of the weapons of mass destruction prior to the invasion would follow the routes that in, of narcotics trafficking, which was very, it was integrated into communist strategy. And of course, uh, you go to Joe Douglas's book, uh, Red Cocaine, about communist involvement in cocaine trafficking in the Western Hemisphere and how Cuba and China and Russia have been involved in this. And anyone who's a regular reader of the LA Times can see that the LA Times has written about how the Mexican mafias are basically uh, uh, sister mafias of the Russian mafia and that the Russian mafia guides them, and so do the, and the Chinese triads are there too, and even the North Koreans are involved. So, uh, and so much of the evidence and the things we're seeing now are, if it's, it's sporadic and it's, it's weak evidence, it's suggestive of what Lunev was talking about. And it's interesting to note, for what an earlier speaker mentioned, is the spe secret speech of Chiao Chen has many points of agreement with Lunev's testimony. Chiao Chen also spoke of the division of North America and China acquiring the lower 48 states, just as Lunev had said. 
And he said that Taiwan was not the real target of China's future war, but they were going to make a lot of noise about Taiwan, that the real target was America, uh, and that that uh, biological weapons would play an essential role in attacking the United States, so that one might expect a pandemic in advance of an invasion. So uh, those are my remarks. Thank you. Jeff, uh, fascinating and, uh, again, very alarming historical antecedents, as well as insights into that uh, that playbook, which, as you say, as a uh, communist enterprise, the CCP is almost assuredly uh, following uh, maybe uh, an eerily level of, uh, of adherence, for that matter. Um, we're going to turn next to uh, my colleague and um, the president of the Center for Security Policy, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Tommy Waller, United States Marine Corps, retired. Um, Tommy is uh, himself a, a highly accomplished uh, and decorated and experienced special operator, a force reconnaissance Marine uh, in his time in the Corps. Uh, he has insights into what has been uh, the uh, kinds of vulnerabilities in our infrastructure that uh, special operators like him uh, operating on behalf of our enemies could exploit, uh, including uh, one that he has spent uh, the better part of a decade feverishly trying to make more resilient against this kind of uh, uh, danger, uh, among others, um, the terrorist physical sabotage um, is just one piece of what can be done to disrupt uh, the electric grid of the United States, cyber, um, electromagnetic pulse being others, uh, and of course, uh, uh, geomagnetic disturbances uh, from Mother Nature as well. All of these are topics that we've asked Tommy to address as part of an assessment of uh, America the vulnerable, uh, what would the CCP target here? And how do we prepare for and defeat such attacks? Let's go to Tommy's video now. Brian, thanks for having me on for this important topic. So we consider uh, the prospect of the Chinese Communist Party employing its personnel through an unsecure border to attack the United States. Many of us are concerned that the most lucrative target for these bad actors would be our electric grid, which of course every one of our critical infrastructures uh, depends on. And of course we depend on that for modern life uh, as we know it. So let's take a look for a second and just you know peel back the onion a little bit on the Chinese Communist Party and, and its thought process, right? Go all the way back though to you know, thousands of years to Sun Tzu. What did Sun Tzu say? He said the supreme art of war is to subdue your enemies without fighting, right? The guy who wrote the art of war said the supreme art is to subdue the enemy without fighting. To take out our electric grid would be to do just that. Uh, viewers of this program are probably familiar with Unrestricted Warfare, published in 1999 by two People's Liberation Army colonels. There, if you look in that document, page 145 uh, of Unrestricted Warfare, there's a whole scenario that they lay out about supposing that a war broke out between two developed nations already possessing full information technology. And in that scenario, they literally say, and I'll, and I'll read from it, that at the same time carrying out a network attack against the enemy so that the civilian electricity network, traffic disp dispatching network, financial transaction network, telephone communications network, and mass media network are completely paralyzed, this will cause the enemy nation to fall into social panic, street riots, and a political crisis, right? So they spell it out in unrestricted warfare. You keep moving forward to the, to the year 2000 when you look at their, their military doctrine when it comes to defensive operations. Uh, in, in a military textbook by the, the People's Liberation Army called The Third World War, uh, Total Information Warfare, published in January 2000, it says, as soon as its computer networks come under attack and are destroyed, the country will slip into a state of paralysis and the lives of its people ground to a halt. Therefore, China should focus on measures to counter computer viruses and nuclear electromagnetic pulse. So what we see there is a persistence in both offensive and defensive use of targeting, or in their case, defending their own computer networks and their own critical infrastructures from threats like electromagnetic pulse. So as we look at that doctrine, then we have to look at also 
what the Chinese have done with respect to their activities. Okay, and, and what I'd like to do for a moment is just focus, I think all the viewers of this program know that the Chinese have been spying on us consistently, that they have a major espionage program, but I'd like to highlight just one small part uh, of that program that should be very worrisome to us. And, and this is something we brought to the attention of the federal government three years ago uh, and that they completely dismissed. And this is the close association uh, between one of the, really the preeminent electric power research organization, EPRI, Electric Power Research Institute, uh, with the Chinese. And this goes back to the early 2000s. And so I will just highlight one piece of this, right, where we talk about the fact that EPRI reported working alongside Chinese utilities to enter data on nuclear plant single point vulnerabilities into a new analysis tool developed by EPRI. And we lay out and show how multiple Chinese nuclear corporations worked with EPRI over nearly 20 years. And then in 2019, those corporations were put on the U.S. Commerce Department's entity list. So why do I, like, why does that matter? Well, if we take a look at the single most valuable and potentially catastrophic area of, of influence in our electric grid, the nuclear power industry, and we think about how much we'd want to protect that, we can see right now that the industry nor the government has protected it. And when we brought this to the attention uh, of, of FERC, they dismissed it. So, well, what does that have to do with sabotage? Well, let's take a look and compare uh, previous cases, historical cases of sabotage against electric grid infrastructure and compare that with the Chinese. So in Mexico, 2013, you had the Knights Templar. Uh, it, it's a, a drug cartel that used physical sabotage to take out the grid for an entire Mexican state. About 400 plus thousand citizens without power and they used that opportunity to execute their opponents. Go to 2014, the entire country of Yemen was blacked out, physical sabotage against the grid by Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. You know, move forward to Pakistan in 2015. You had jihadis in Pakistan take out 80% of the country's grid using physical sabotage. Again, in 2015, in November, uh, a large portion of Ukraine in Crimea was taken out again by physical sabotage. Now, you compare the bad actors of Al Qaeda, of a, you know AQAP, uh, jihadis in Pakistan, and, and the Knights Templar drug cartel. Compare that on one hand with the Chinese Communist Party, particularly with what I just <laughs> expressed about their penetration of our nuclear industry. Why does that matter? Well, it matters because we know, based on attacks that took place in this country against our grid infrastructure, particularly one in 2013, April 2013, the Metcalf PG&E substation outside of San Jose, California was attacked. We still don't know who carried out the professional attack. But the result of that was a classified study by FERC, which was leaked to the Wall Street Journal, which said that just nine, if they knew which nine, just nine transformer substations attacked uh, could create a cascading failure that would take out the entire grid of the United States for up to 18 months. Based on what we know of the Chinese Communist Party and its diligence in both espionage and in, in cyber penetration and its human intelligence gathering, we have to assume that the Chinese Communist Party knows which nine of those substations to attack. So when we hear about you know, hundreds of military age males pouring across the border that are Chinese, we, we have to be worried that they might decide to attack our grid with physical sabotage. So that begs the question, are we ready for that, right? How, how well is our grid protected? I would encourage viewers just to drive down the road and look. Just look at the substations supporting your community. You probably will see when you drive down the highway uh, that, that you know there'll be a barrier uh, that prevents sound from getting to the neighborhoods uh, from that highway, but you'll go right past those barriers and you'll see an electric substation with maybe a chain link fence to protect it, right? This is something that we've complained to the U.S. federal government about. We've lodged formal complaints we did so back in 2020. At that time, uh, there were more than 578 attacks from January 2010 to 2019 on grid infrastructure in the United States. That formal complaint that we lodged uh, to FERC, even though we had uh, a letter from the former CIA director, that was dismissed. This October, you may have noticed in the news, Moore County 
or I should say last October, Moore County, North Carolina, physical sabotage against the grid, a lot of public attention to it. And so uh, FERC, the federal government, told the industry to, hey, reevaluate your physical security standards. Predictably, the industry came back and said, hey, there's no, no recommended changes. We just lodged a, a formal petition with FERC uh, for them to, to reevaluate the physical security standards. We expect that this is going to be dismissed. The reason I share the, this history with you is as of last October, there were 919 attacks on the grid since January 2010 to, it was September actually, of 2022, 919 attacks. That doesn't even count October in Moore County. That's a frequency of more than one per week. And yet I can promise you right now that on their own, the federal government and the electric power industry writ large is not gonna fix the problem. They've had plenty of time to do it. So what does that mean? We've gotta work this from the bottom up. It's something that states should absolutely work. Texas is working it now. Maybe on a future webinar, we can talk about what's, uh, what's happened in Texas with respect to legislation there. But really, ultimately, what it comes down to is individual resilience and preparedness, bringing back the civil defense mindset within our population, making sure that people could be ready to live for a little bit of time with a no notice power outage. That's exactly what people in Moore County had, no notice, not like a hurricane, uh, their lights just go out, right? And if we're talking about the Chinese Communist Party, we know that they know how to turn the lights off for a long time. And so we've got to be prepared for that. So thank you for having me on to talk about this important topic. And we just need to do what we can to make sure we're prepared uh, to deal with what seems to be really an impending crisis that the Chinese could create for us by taking down our grid. Colonel Waller, you know wherever you speak. This is, uh, again, further evidence of uh, the complexity and gravity of the danger that we're facing. And I appreciate you finding the time to give us uh, those comments by recorded video. We're going to turn finally to a man who we often uh, rely upon as the cleanup matter in these programs. Uh, his name is Brian Kennedy. He is the chairman of our Committee on the Present Danger of China, um, a very highly regarded strategist and public policy uh, intellectual. He has, um, among other things, run the highly regarded Claremont Institute, and these days it's with the American Strategy Group. We're uh, delighted to have him with us always, and especially uh, to take on the task of uh, helping walk through, uh, if you would, Brian, um, what it's going to take, if we can at this late date, still deter the Chinese Communist Party from engaging in these kinds of threats to us inside our country. And as Colonel Waller was speaking to in, in a sort of microcosmic example, the grid, uh, failing that, what must we be about right now to try to uh, minimize the damage that they can cause? Thank you for joining us, Brian, over to you. Well, thank you, Frank, and, and thank you for organizing this. This is, I think, one of the very best panels we've ever had, uh, myself excluded, but you, you've done a wonderful job finding the most important people to talk about uh, this important subject. I'm reminded of my colleague, Angelo Cotavilla, who passed away last year. Angelo, who was a proponent of national missile defense and um, fixing our intelligence community and getting America back on track when it comes to the common sense of the things that we're up against. He'd often say that America is no longer a serious nation. We're not serious because we look at the things that are happening in this country and we don't do anything about them. Here we are against communist China um, and we're not prepared for the war we're in. I would say, Frank, it's not about deterring communist China. We're past that. This is no longer a deterrence question. It's how do we fight the war in real time? They declared the Communist Chinese Party, uh, Chinese Communist Party, excuse me, declared a people's war against the United States in 2019. And they did that because Donald Trump wanted to stop their theft of American intellectual property. They thought that was morally outrageous. They believe they have the right to our intellectual property. 
So they declare a people's war against the United States. Within six months, COVID-19 is spreading. Within six months of that, America's in lockdown. Throughout the summer of 2020, we have the riots in the streets that we've chronicled here. Uh, and we had a fundamental alteration of our political system that was driven to no small degree by the Chinese Communist Party. So they think of themselves as actively at war with us today. And if we consider COVID-19 a form of biowarfare against the United States and fentanyl as chemical warfare against the United States and this flood of illegal immigration, thanks to the Biden administration, as part of an invasion, it's no longer about a deterring war. We're in a war. It's actively going on today. When history books are written, they will chronicle how the war started in 2019 and that we're just living through the early parts of that war. When you look at you know, Chinese theory of all this, and I, I very much uh, take to heart the argument that Jeff Nyquist has laid out, pointing out General Shi Hao Shin and his speech from probably roughly 2000, where, where he is basically saying that it's going to be China versus America. There's no question about that in his mind. And he was a very influential military planner. He was a general, but he was also one of the leading, uh, let's call them military diplomats. When the Chinese would send someone to the United States, it was invariably at that time, Shi Hao Shin, because he was very good at at, at um, saying one thing internally in, to, in China to the Politburo and another thing to American policymakers. But Shi Hao Shin to the Politburo was laying out the case that war with the United States is inevitable, that we're a communist country, that the party is the thing that matters most, and that if we're going to preserve the party, we have to destroy the United States. And we also have, because of that, a desire, and he, he's here quoting Chairman Mao, that Chairman Mao pointed out that it would be much easier to maintain control of the Chinese Communist Party if in fact the Chinese people could spread to the United States. And so to the extent that we could occupy the United States, it will be much easier to control our communist experiment in totalitarianism. So whether it was him back then saying it and what we're living through today, you see a continuity of Chinese thought. They think of themselves at war with us they believe that they can take down the United States. They believe that it is perhaps necessary to take down the United States first before they go after Taiwan. Because if they can take down the United States now, they won't have to have armed conflict with Taiwan. And he even speculates, General Shi Hao Shin, that you may have to kill through biowarfare 100 or 200 million Americans. But if war is going to happen anyway, you know, so be it. That's a very serious way of thinking of the world that our side should have taken seriously. We don't take that seriously today. Today, we have a ruling class, in the words of Cotevilla, we have a ruling class that believes in immigration. It believes even in illegal immigration. Because anything to lower, you know, costs, labor costs in our society, they somehow think is a good thing. They no longer believe in what it really means to be an American citizen. And so they're not willing to stop an invasion on the border. They're not willing to tolerate an America first president like Donald Trump. And they're putting us in a position today where we are subservient to communist China. Today, we have an administration that is not serious about our national defense. They're not serious about engaging in war with communist China to stop everything that is going on today, whether it's COVID-19 or even fentanyl. What are we doing to stop that? 100,000 Americans will die from that this year or more.
What are we doing to stop that? One could one could humbly argue, nothing. And again, until we're prepared to take seriously that war is happening in this country, this is not an abstraction. This is real. And to pick up on something that Tommy Waller said, the thing that matters the most today is individual resilience. You may, be, you may not be able to change our politics, but you can prepare for war. You can make sure your family is provided for. You can have extra food. You can have generators. You can have you know guns and ammo and be prepared to defend yourself and your family and your community. And you can make it very costly for communist China or Russia if they should ever come to the United States to try to take us by force, make it very costly for them because we, the United States are going to remain a free people no matter what. Thank you, Frank. Brian, thank you. An uplifting note, uh, very much needed at the moment, I think. We do have time for some questions, I believe, and questions that, that just draw out from what you've already shared a little bit more clarity if it's possible on the numbers, as well as the character of the individuals coming through. I think Michael used the term paramilitary. Uh, you talked, Todd, about um, you know, espionage uh, assets. Uh, there's a, there is a, a number that I've heard bounced around. I'm not sure it's provenance. Uh, it might be one of you, it might not be. You may agree with it, you may not, but uh, if we could get some clarity on it. And that is that there may be as many as five thousand individuals who meet more or less the following characteristics. They're unaccompanied fighting age Chinese national men who have been moving through uh, the Darien or other parts of uh, the transit up to the border and across um, in groups wearing more or less identical kit, um, that is to say backpacks and canteens and the like. Uh, and that the the numbers may be on the order of something like uh, five battalions worth or 5,000 of them in recent months alone. And again, I'm not sure that we have enough precision on any of these numbers to say for certain whether that's roughly right, off by a factor of you know 10 either way or or uh, whatever else we can shed light on. But to the to the extent that it's kind of foundational to this particular conversation, um, setting aside for the moment, we'll get to uh, some of the other uh, Chinese nationals who may be contributing to the threat internal to the United States at the moment. But could could either of you shed further light on whether this is a seemingly accurate way of depicting what we're now seeing a lot of uh, in terms of these Chinese men and their other attributes? It would be hard to imagine that there's fewer than 5,000, although I don't know that to be true. But seeing what I see here on the ground, either coming across the borders as they actually emerge into the United States or the inputs that I'm seeing down and through Darien uh, Gap and, and also just various other things that I study constantly. Uh, uh, for instance, many of the Chinese, they do not come through the Darien Gap. They have other inputs. They go to Cancun first, and they'll go to these package tours, right? So they, like Todd mentioned on Galapagos, they'll do the same in Cancun, and they meet their snakeheads there. Snakehead is the is a um, is a term uh, that is the Chinese term for um, for coyote, right? So they meet their snakeheads in Cancun or Mexico City or in Tapachula. Tapachula, of course, is that southernmost city in Mexico is sort of like their El Paso from the Guatemala border. Uh, Todd Bensman's been there. I've been there. It's a huge clearinghouse. But again, a lot of them come through in different ways. For instance, some are coming through the northern border. We don't know those numbers. It's a big border as well. Uh, and so um, how are they getting in? Many different ways. How many are here? Who knows? I mean, nobody would know, actually, because keep in mind, the southern border of the United States has thousands of crossings. And I'm not exaggerating i mean i'm down there all the time i'm either watching it from the mexican side watching it from our side or i'm watching inputs down in you know different places let's talk about just real quick hong kong as you know i was in hong kong quite a bit with uh, gordon chang and others and um and i was there for seven months until they took me to the airplane and 
close the door and kick me out, right? Uh, one of the ways that Hong Kong was taken was preparatory uh, acts of, of uh, weaponized migration. Weaponized migration doesn't necessarily mean you just come in with rifles, right? It can mean you just come in with numbers. And so they took over the schools. They were, you know, the, the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, was sending in somewhere between 100 to 150 mainlanders for years every day, right? They would say every day they would just come in, take more apartments, take more jobs, get jobs in the school, start teaching Mandarin instead of Cantonese, start getting uh, important bureaucratic jobs, uh, affecting the um, elections, of course, and um, and um, uh, and various other acts. And finally, I was there for the final shows there, uh, you know, starting in June of 2019. And now Hong Kong has fallen. A lot of that was preparatory acts. I was in Tibet, where I saw the same thing, you know, and and, and they're obviously prep, preparing Taiwan for the same. I was just on Ishigaki Island recently, which is sort of like the Key West of of Japan. Ishigaki Island is some of the closest uh, Japanese or islands. It's more than one. Uh, it, it, close to Taiwan. I was talking with the mayor there and talking with actually some intelligence people up in Tokyo and a retired three star general. Everybody's concerned that conflict with uh, Taiwan. We'll end up with a big flood of people from Taiwan. Of course, Taiwan and Japan have very close relations, but they're very concerned that they'll just be uh, flooded with mainland spies and, and paramilitaries, and they'll just take over Ishigaki Island. And that's part of Okinawa Prefecture, of course, and then Island Hop on all the way up. Anyway, again, you'll have to press pause on me, Frank, because I'll go for hours on this. All right, well, pause. This is all thank I you. do. Yeah, Michael, thank you so much. Uh, Todd, we're just trying to get a sense whether from your own eyewitness vantage point on the border inside Mexico, as well as on our side, uh, as you watch the weaponized immigration is the way Michael Yon just put it, of these Chinese men, fighting age, unaccompanied, um, are you discerning, as I think Michael has reported elsewhere, that they seem to be both very fit as well as carrying similar gear, if not identical, uh, as well as uh, moving in groups. Uh, did, did that characterize uh, what the hundred or so that seem to be coming across most days are, look like? And are they, as you see it, rising to a level that might uh, amount to something on the order of 5,000 of these folks inside the United States at this point, that would be the equivalent of five battalions if they were in fact military units uh, configured like ours. Well, what I've noticed is that the Chinese that I've met are young. So, you know, by definition, when you're young, you're gonna typically be pretty fit. And especially if you've been on the trail for a while through the dairy and you're gonna lose a few pounds. But in any case, you know, they do tend to be young, but also it's difficult to really to interview them. Uh, when I've tried to interview them, I think I sent you some video. If you look at my the video of me trying to interview them, you know, a lot of them, like Michael said, they either don't know English or they're pretending not to know English. And I think uh, Michael or uh, Chuck Holton, somebody actually brought some interpreters with them one, one time, we really need to just kind of be able to uh, interview them and not on one of those apps, uh, one of those, they're terrible. Uh, but in, even if, uh, what I think would happen is that even if you could interview them, uh, they, they appear to be very well coached. Uh, and, you know, like I said before, Chinese have been coming in for many years over the border. And the thing, thing that when I was working in intelligence in Texas, uh, we were always very concerned about the Chinese coming in back then, and there was a, there was intelligence reporting uh, about them, a lot of intelligence reporting about them. Uh, the story was always that they just wouldn't talk. They were coached. They would never talk about how who brought them in, how they got in, why they're coming, what they're fleeing. Uh, well, they would say what they're fleeing. It would it would always be. Falun Gong, they were Falun Gong, they were Christians, they were, and it would, they had the same story. So they were coached. They were always just very coached. Um, and also they were being brought in in those days by uh, organized crime, Chinese organized crime. Uh, they call them snakeheads. Uh, and those organized crime uh, groups uh, would have them uh, under threat 
if you talk about us, if you say anything about us, uh, we'll kill your family in your home village, that sort of thing. So there was some of that. And I do believe that there was a lot of um, labor exploitation going on uh, in those days as well. But by and large, like I said, uh, they are going to be young, fit, uh, military aged. Uh, certainly, uh, there are going to be spies among them. Uh, I would bet. I would bet anything that there are spies at the very least coming in over that southern border, and we'll find out about it eventually when we suss them out, oh, or they suss us out, as the case may be. Um, Todd, thank you again. Uh, appreciate you sticking around. Um, I did want to uh, ask Rick Fisher. You heard, um, I think, Jeff Nyquist talking about the history of, uh, you know, communists uh, from the Soviet era through Russia, uh, as well as, you know, I think uh, further reinforcing points you've made about China. Um, Rick, do, does the fact that whether it's in Norway with the Germans or whether it's uh, the Stanislav Lunyev uh, revelations, uh, you know, uh, in any way uh, prompt you to uh, uh, rethink your position, or does it simply reinforce uh, the warnings that you've offered that uh, baked into, you know, Chinese doctrine, set aside the communist history or the totalitarian history more generally? This is what we have to expect if, uh, if in fact, as Brian talked about, the Chi Ha Chan and company are uh, right that uh, we're the main enemy and they're coming for us uh, from outside as well as inside the country. 70 years of infiltration, uh, compromise, espionage, trying to undermine the government of Taiwan in, in every which way they can. That is one of the most public uh, demonstrations of how the Chinese Communist Party is committed to using every means uh, necessary prior to a full out kinetic war to achieve victory. And uh, I, I would uh, uh, bet uh, uh, good money that uh, this same process has been underway in Japan for generations, South Korea for generations. Uh, um, the uh, relationship between uh, anti-American uh, uh, groups in Okinawa and uh, uh, China is already known to be close. Of course, the Chinese would be very active in trying to turn the, popu the indigenous population in Okinawa against uh, the major uh, Japanese and American uh, military bases there because they will be decisive in whether uh, an actual invasion of Taiwan, uh, full up conventional invasion, is is going to be impeded, slowed down, or even stopped. So uh, what I've been hearing from your guests, uh, Frank, only serves to confirm that indeed, uh, as, as Brian uh, very clearly stated, uh, the United States is under invasion as, as are our, our, our allies especially our allies in Asia. Uh, and we need a civil defense mentality. We need a civil defense culture and we need civil defense leadership. As Brian and others have pointed out, we need individual responsibility to be taken as well as looking for a more uh, comprehensive uh, government enabled and assisted uh, civil defense. I think it's fair to say. Let me ask you, Jeff, as um, one of our guests, we had, uh, by the way, a, a really prodigious outpouring of very thoughtful questions and comments from our audience, uh, for which we're very grateful. But one that I had not heard of, and I don't know whether you've got any insights into this, uh, whether it's true or whether it's uh, what might well uh, be in the works, but one of our guests questioned a reported disappearance of 30,000 tons of ammonium nitrate on a train being shipped uh, inside the United States, uh, gone missing, uh, according to this uh, questioner. 
Um, I, I wonder whether, given problems we've been having with trains, given problems we've been having with explosions, uh, notably in food-related uh, industrial operations across the country, um, whether this is uh, a portent of things to come, whether it's something that might be evidence of um, how uh, an insurgency could be supplied uh, in addition to whatever is being uh, brought across the border. Do you have any insights into this story or, or you know, what it, uh, what it suggests could be afoot in our country? Yeah, uh, diversionary operations in conjunction with uh, invasion or major political operations are natural. Uh, the defector literature has other indications. The GRU defector, Vladimir Rezin, who writes under the name Viktor Suvorov, wrote a book called um, Spetsnaz, in which he has a chapter on Spetsnaz's Third World War. And he talks about uh, something called the Overture, which is the period before the communist bloc goes into all-out kinetic warfare. And in this period, um, there would be terrorist attacks against the United States and its allies, uh, mass terrorist attacks, that would not appear to have any connection to the communists. Uh, for example, Arab um, uh, Lunev once said to me along these lines, if you ever hear that Arab terrorists have attacked an American city with a nuclear weapon, don't believe it. He said, the attack will be my people. It will be Spetsnaz doing it. I think that it's, it's safe to say that, uh, that these things are well worked out. In, in, shockingly, in Suvorov's book, which was written in 1987, he talked about Russian elaborate or Russian preparations to make a double of the United States vice president, uh, that they always maintained uh, a, a Russian who spoke perfect, flawless English, who looked exactly like him. And they would make a video presentation and a team of their agents would drill into our cable connections under New York. And he would appear on all the news, on all everybody's TV set, this fake vice president saying that there was a coup underway, that the president had been killed, that he was now the effective president, and for the U.S. military to stand down and await for clarification of the situation. Um, so that this kind of operation that, that you have, that they would disguise an attack on the United States as a military coup, for example, or a series of domestic terrorist attacks or uprising or civil, beginning of a civil war or Arab terrorist attack. You see, they could dis, they have it in their mind to have a very powerful diversionary operation to confuse everybody about what's really going on. Brian Kennedy, lastly, let me ask you, you you've spoken, I think, appropriately, and it's, it's certainly the thrust of uh, so many of our programs in this webinar series and I never can get this to quite uh, quite turn up properly, but the, the book, The Indictment, which we've drawn heavily upon these webinars to inform, makes clear we are at war with the Chinese Communist Party, uh, or more to the point, it is at war with us. And it has been going on at the unrestricted level, uh, now the People's War, and uh, it seems uh, perhaps momentarily to move into this next uh, violent phase. At the same time, the Biden administration is encouraging the belief that um, there's a new rapprochement that is in the offing with the Chinese, that uh, I think the president said that silly balloon is now behind us and uh, we are going to reopen the hotline and uh, there's all kinds of opportunities for um, collaborative efforts on trade and, and the like. You've indicated that they're not serious. Um, I wonder if that's considerably understating the problem. And uh, I'd like you just to, if you could, uh, both, you know, based on your own study of the matter uh, and knowledge of American political life, but also this really important part of the unrestricted warfare program of the Chinese Communist Party, namely uh, so-called elite capture to talk about whether it isn't a matter of unseriousness or certainly incompetence, but rather design uh, that uh, is leaving the border open, uh, doing nothing to uh, secure the grid, uh, if anything, to you know compound some of the vulnerabilities. 
Tommy Waller gave a, a, an important rendering of uh, the, the things that are wrong here. In addition, as some of our audience have pointed out, we're actually compounding matters by including, of course, in the grid infrastructure, um, wind and solar equipment manufactured in China. Mm -hmm. And by the way, also high voltage transformers with uh, known back doors, it seems, in some cases at least. Uh, all of this bespeaks um, a, a capture uh, and a, well, uh, enabling of the threat we are facing from the Chinese Communist Party, making all the more urgent the kind of efforts that you've talked about in terms of uh, self-reliance and um, preparation for what may be in the offing, uh, not relying on our government. But could you speak through, uh, you know, your various uh, insights uh, about uh, what is going on here that may be considerably different than just uh, not being serious? Yes, yes, Frank. Well, my first insight would be people need to buy your new book, The Indictment, because I do think it lays out a lot of these things in detail. And I, I was sharing it with some friends recently, and they really enjoyed both the size of it, the tone of it, and how useful it was inside the book, because we have um, some links to various webinars that we've done and a real explanation in detail. This is not just, you know, talking about the problem, but it's also laying it all out for people, people to really understand, you know, when we talk about people not being serious, that's in part because we don't want to, you know, really put on them this idea that they're being traitorous or treasonous or that they're acting so much in the national against the national interest that they've gone over to the other side. Uh, sometimes that's happened in American society. I don't know if that's true with the Biden administration. So let me state that clearly. And I state it clearly because we don't have a free country today. We have to watch what we say, don't we? Because people are going to listen to this and they're going to take certain things from it. And so we can't speak freely in America anymore because this country of ours is being lost to a political establishment that, that doesn't believe still today in the Constitution and freedom of speech. That alone should be a chilling thing for all Americans. And when you combine that with the fact that the Biden administration has embraced this globalist worldview and against all evidence is embracing communist China as a potential partner of ours, that, that it defies logic, it defies common sense. Americans look at that and they don't quite understand what is going on. I would say when it comes to the seriousness of where we are today, where is the Congress, where are the U.S. senators taking this seriously? Congressman Gallagher and his China committee needs to take up the things we talked about today seriously as if they're in the middle of a war. And I think he's a good man and I believe he will do so. And we need to help him every way we can. Where are the Republican senators or the Democrat senators who are willing to embrace this idea that we are at war and they will do something about it? The American people need to wake up and to tell their elected representatives that this has to stop. And until we take that seriously, Frank, I think our politics, the, the kind of perceptions that are out there are, are so confused. There's so much gaslighting going on. The media is so irresponsible. The lack of real journalism is so profound that Americans, as I said in my remarks and others have alluded to as well as you, Frank, Americans need to take responsibility themselves for learning about this, to be responsible for the well-being of their families, and to treat this as if, in fact, we're in a war that has to be dealt with on a daily basis. Don't need to overreact, but need to take it seriously as if your life depended on it. Brian, thank you. Indeed, all of our lives depend upon it. If we've taken nothing else away from this conversation, 
and so many of the others that have preceded it, it is that this is deadly serious business. Uh, we are up against the greatest existential threat to freedom in the nation's history, bar none. Uh, we are, I personally believe, let me just say I'm speaking for myself, but I personally believe that we are dealing with a government under Joe Biden that is uh, compromised extensively and captured for that matter by the Chinese Communist Party and is as a result not reliable in terms of doing what we have laid out here at a minimum is needed to contend with the possibility of um, open insurgent operations inside America. Uh, that may well be in prospect. Um, I think the, uh, the evidence of that, both what we're seeing at the border coming across it, uh, what uh, doctrinally is spelled out, what uh, is, is happening on the ground as best we can discern it is, uh, is all evidence that this cannot be ignored further. And those who are in elective office representing us nominally must, as Brian has just said, take these topics, take these developments, take these insights uh, seriously. And I, I would just add to your very kind comments about uh, the indictment, as important as anything that's in it are the 20 actionable steps that we think need to be taken. And I hope that uh, this audience and those who will be watching this program in the days to come will, in fact, look at those as the kinds of things that uh, they insist that their elected representatives do on behalf of all of us as the hour is late and the need is great and growing. I wanted to say in closing, uh, thank you to each of our superb presenters. Um, this was uh, not all of the ones we had in mind, but they've performed handsomely. Several others were unable to join us at the end of the, the day. But my thanks to Michael Yawn and uh, Todd Benzman for your extraordinary efforts to uh, chronicle what is happening at the borders and keep us surprised of them. Uh, to, of course, uh, Rick Fisher and uh, Jeff Nyquist for your expertise on the plan, as best we can discern it. Uh, Tommy Waller, of course, for his recorded uh, efforts to shed light on the various vulnerabilities that enemies like the Chinese Communist Party are clearly capable of exploiting to our great detriment. And then not least, of course, uh, Brian Kennedy, the chairman of our Committee on the Present Danger of China for his putting it into uh, the sort of call to action that uh, must be our principal takeaway from really each and every one of these webinars. My thanks to Didi Logason and Oleg Atbashian as well for making them all possible. We will have short webinar up. I think it is, as Brian said, one of the most important we've done, and I hope that you will share it wildly. And I want to just say again to our audience present for your very active engagement on this particular program. We appreciate it and um, encourage you and all of those in the future who will be taking this aboard, as I'm fond of saying, to go forth and multiply. This is Frank Afney. Thanks for being with us. Didi, back to you. Thank you, Frank. And thanks to all of our audience once again for being here today. We appreciate your support. A video of this webinar will post to presentdangerchina.org within a day of the conclusion of our program. Please share this and our other programs with your elected representatives, colleagues, and other networks. And join us again next week for our next installment of our Committee on the Present Danger China webinar series on the CCP's unrestricted warfare against America and the free world, and how the USA is betrayed by CCP-captured elites. Thanks for joining us today, and goodbye. Russian man claiming to hold top-level secrets about Russian advanced bombers has just turned up at the U.S. southern border, seeking asylum. The man claims to have been an engineer at a production facility over in the city of Kazan, and he says that he possesses top-secret information about the White Swan Tu-160.
is the most advanced bomber in the Russian arsenal. U.S. border officials, they interviewed the man, and they determined that his story was in fact credible and eventually passed him off to the FBI, who are still in the process of interrogating him right now. However, analysts have pointed out that the fact that the story was even leaked to the public is an indication that perhaps the American government is encouraging other Russians who also hold top-level secrets to also escape to America. And if you thought that was interesting, well then you should click on that button below this video and check out Epic TV, one of the best no censorship video platforms on the internet.